Okay, it is my great pleasure to introduce Marina Blanton from the University at Buffalo here today in the Crisp Speaker Series. Actually, Marina and I, we know each other for a very long time, right? We've uh, been together in grad school and uh, she's now a full professor at the University at Buffalo, also still working in multi-party computation. And she just told me on the way to lunch that she managed to get some multi-party computation established in practice. So she's one of the few people who uh, actually managed to do that. And she will tell us about all of the remaining problems uh, that are there today. And so please welcome Marina. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to be here and speaking in front of you. And what I chose to talk about um, today in, in, in some ways sort of encompasses my vision of the field. I've been working with secure multi-party computation for close to 20 years now, right? It seems like a long time. And so, you know, during that time, we've seen great progress. Uh, that there's a lot of different advances that are made in different directions. But what I would like to, the message that I'd like to convey today is that there's still quite a bit of work that is ahead of us. And the challenge is, you know, the way we'll look at it may be different, but we still, you know, need to do work before we feel that it's gonna be ready for large scale use. And so today, like during my presentation, I just wanted to say that, you know, probably everybody knows here, you know, understands at least to some extent what secure computation is. I'll say secure multi-party computation is the area where I would like to be able to compute with data that is somehow private, proprietary, sensitive, classified, not easily accessible, and that may not be owned uh, and stored in one place. Right, so the idea is that the data can be distributed across different places and we would like to use it in computation. And um, you know, everybody is gonna in be interested in the results, right? We'll like to do the computation. We know it's beneficial, but uh, it's not necessarily trivial to do it without uh, doing data protection. So uh, you know, overall, we'll see that we're gonna use cryptographic techniques to uh, compute the functionality that we'd like to compute with data so we don't have access to it in the clear. And so this is a figure that I would like to use throughout the presentation that sort of uh, gives an example of what we can do. So in this case, we have a number of hospitals that um, see, have some patients and their records. And I would like to be able to analyze you know, extract some meaningful patterns or some other information, say, what is the most effective treatment for this rare condition is. But then the matter of fact is that none of them have enough data to be able to make that analysis or predictions reliably. And so they would like to cooperate. They would like to somehow jointly uh, assemble their data into this data set, the virtual data set, and be able to run the computation and get the result. So uh, we'll, we can sort of separate the parties who are doing the computation uh, as same computational nodes that can be outsourced to third parties. And then somebody is gonna get the result of the computation. So for the sake of this example, say they're gonna know what's the most effective treatment for that condition is. Right? And so what we see in this figure is that they're gonna enter their inputs into a protected form into, into the computation. The computation is gonna take place between the nodes who are dedicated for the computation itself. And then somebody, the number of agreed parties are gonna receive the result of the computation. So we'd like to separate the data owners from the participants of the computation itself and the computation recipients, right? So we have these different groups. And so um, if you look at the field, the way um, it's projected, the way it went. For a long time, the focus was on how to do this, what kind of techniques we have, because we started uh, from the approach where this is actually quite a bit slow. And over the years, the focus was on the speed, how we can do this faster, how we can do this better, how we can cover more functionalities that we couldn't cover before. So the focus has been on techniques. There is a variety of different approaches that are quite a bit different for two-party computation, you know, multi-party computation, um, and you know, all of them made advances in the past. So the speed, 
greatly reduced the availability of tools that we have greatly um, increased. So now that there is actually well-developed solutions, there is now um, these solutions being deployed in practice in you know, large uh, tech companies and startups, and also the amount of computation associated with uh, the, you know, these techniques reduced. So we have the, the field matured, but looking at that, you know, we see, is this enough? Is this everything that we'd we'll like to be able to look at and study? So if going back to our figure, the, the entire figure, the focus has been on how we do the techniques. So in some way, the way we uh, encode the data, right? So it's not loud enough? Uh, the, the, the people in the back, um, the people to hear, uh, yeah. uh, just, just put the microphone. Higher? Right. Is this better? Okay. All right. All right. All right. So the focus has been on how we do this on the techniques. So going back to this figure, I highlighted in red basically the way you would encode the data, the way you would protect it and the way the computation takes place, this is the techniques that, you know, the, where we've studied, right? So there's a lot of effort was put in, it's been very productive, we made a lot of progress, but what I argue is that's not the entire picture. So what is not captured in, um, you know, the, the previous space was what we do with inputs, right? So, you know, typically inputs are, the validity, trustworthiness of inputs is beyond the scope of the standard threat models that we use. Because the threat model says that given the inputs when they come in, we're gonna ensure that during the computation itself, nothing is revealed about private data. And so because inputs are private, we cannot necessarily dictate much information about it, right? So it's, there's not necessarily effective mechanisms for verifying the data is correct, this is what it should be, and there is no way to somehow trust that the data is correct. So from that point of view, it's not necessarily easy to be able to detect input tampering into the computation. But on the other hand, if somebody actually changes the input, that can have huge impacts on the computation, on correctness of the result, and what kind of information you can learn. And right? so this, like for one, the computation can be useless because then the result that you get is garbage. And uh, the second point here is that it's possible that everybody gets garbage, but the attacker is able to remove the noise that they injected and have the output for themselves. So one simple example is say the average function, where for example, I'd like to know the average salary of everybody in the group. So if I say my salary is a million dollars, that everybody is going to get the average and feel bad about their own salary, right? But then I can actually compensate for the error that I introduced and learn the true value that represents the average for the group, right? But this is um, you know, outside of what we typically study. And uh, so what I'd like to uh, sort of put forward as a, as a part of this talk that's saying that it's also an important topic that in some cases can have significant consequences. And so in this case uh, on this figure is what's missing is somehow verifying that the input is correct. Well, the reason why um, it was outside of the scope of the uh, threat model that we typically employ is because it's a difficult problem, right? It's a difficult problem because we cannot necessarily uh, know what are the right inputs are, you know, how to check. There is, could be certain types of checking, for example, say, if, you know, I expect that everybody's salary is in a particular range, we can ensure that people submit in that range. For example, I don't submit negative salary. So this is, you know, things like this we can do as part of secure computation, uh, but it's not going to be enough. There are certain cases where you can do, for example, input certification. And when we talk about certificates, it's typically in the way of signatures. But in the context of this space, that's integrating 
the signatures or whatever forms the certificates take, which may be different from conventional signatures, to ensure that you can verify um, cheaply in an efficient way that the computation or the inputs are authentic, and then you proceed with the computation itself, right? So there is a couple of examples, there is a couple of domains uh, where this is useful, and one that I ran into and in my work directly was using genomic data, where, for example, you can have tests that are pretty high stakes. And in this case, if you're doing genomic, um, you know, information genomic tests, for example, like paternity, you uh, it's easy to lie about, depending on the on the structure of the function, you might lie about your inputs and get the inputs of the other party. And basically the um, computation is gonna be incorrect and you additionally learn some inputs that you're not supposed to learn. And so in that case, um, it would be interesting to you know, sort of develop solutions that are cheaper and cheaper the way we've done with the entire uh, you know, uh, types of techniques that are used for secure computation. But uh, I think there could be sort of new different directions that potentially people can envision in terms of addressing this problem. Because I think if uh, that these kind of techniques are being used in our you know, every, everyday interaction, it's least what we hope for, right? In application more and more commonly, that we would need some sort of a mechanism to at least for certain applications that are critical in that space, if we know that it's easy to abuse the kind of computation to have some additional protection, right? Um, and then the next one that I wanna say that's kind of out of scope is the functionality itself. So traditionally, when uh, we sort of look at the way the definitions are formed, they'll say, well, given this function, we want to ensure that during the computation itself, there is no unauthorized leakage. And sometimes we permit certain kind, you know, certain kind of leakage, right? And the most common type of leakage could be from the output itself of the function. So typically when we look at this, we'll say, well, we assume that the participants agreed ahead of time that this function is good and it's suitable for their purposes. They agree to contribute the data to the computation. But what um, you know, our, what I'm arguing here is that we don't have enough information to know is any given function suitable for secure computation or not. How much information is disclosed through the so-called authorized information disclosure? Right. So now you know, going back to this figure, what we're computing also you know plays role in this case, right? The function itself. Can we develop some sort of a mechanism or a metric for knowing that this function is suitable for secure computation or not? And you know, maybe I'll give like one example of you know medical data that is protected by law, right? For example, um, it's you know sort of seems obvious for people working in the space is that you know we can apply secure computation techniques to protect data that can be much better protected than the current practices of sharing medical data. So that can comply with the privacy laws that we have like HIPAA in the US um, and that would be sufficient, but the uh, great, well, a gray zone in this case is what you're computing, right? If you're computing the, you know, if the function that you wanna learn is which treatment is the most effective, that's certainly not personal information, not personal records. But if you're training a model that might memorize information from the patient records, then it shouldn't be treated as something that is compliant with the regulations that govern um, medical data. And so, you know, basically what I'm saying is that this is a space that hasn't been sufficiently explored. And we, what I would like to be able to do is develop some sort of metric or measurement of how difficult is it for me to reverse engineer the function, right? Get something about the inputs from the output. And I would like to say that um, there's already sort of efforts in this direction, in particular in the case of say uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, when people look 
uh, the models that, that's been trained and say it's it's not safe to release that if it's been trained on private data because it memorizes certain portions of the records on which it was trained. But you know, in general, is there a metric that we can utilize that's saying that all information disclosure is small enough, right? Because typically when we permit information disclosure, we cannot necessarily tell very well what that leakage allows somebody to do, right? I mean, it's, it's difficult in general, but can we somehow, um, you know, if we want to evaluate a function uh, in, in this context using secure computation techniques, can we say that it's low compliant? For example, like in the, hey, in the case of um, health medical data protection, uh, what else do we need to do in, in this space? And so basically, I mean, I think uh, this is the part, well, this is the part that I would like to talk about later and in this talk and spend a little bit more time in terms of the information that we developed, the, the results that we have. But for the sort of the first part, for the IRU, I would like to also talk about the third component that uh, where it wasn't uh, something that we've seen in the literature before, and that is of linked computation. So this is the case where instead of just getting the data for the purposes of one computation, you run it, and basically everything goes away, right? There are circumstances where you will need to do repeated, um, uh, repeated executions on the same or related data. And this is when it becomes interesting. So in the literature, the definition uh, is written just for one computation. You do computation once and then everybody goes home. But in, in our work, we ran into the case where uh, the, this is not the case, and what's interesting is that the participants change. And this is that it brings like a new twist to the formulation itself. So in a way, what we're dealing with, uh, there is computation took place, and there are some values that are produced as a result of that computation that are again being fed into another phase of the computation. And so as I said, the interesting example was where the participants are not the same, or maybe uh, information about participants who left and are not there anymore remains through this sort of pipeline, right? Something was remembered about them and now it's being used later, even though they're not participants anymore. Um, and so the um, context in which we encountered that was of um, privacy preserving biometric based authentication. So in this case, basically what happens is we would like a user to be able to register in the system with their biometric data, but because it's sensitive, we don't want that to be stored in the clear. So instead is somehow distributed in a protected form, say possibly split across multiple servers or might maybe encrypted in a way that the server doesn't see the data itself. And then when the user comes in, at the authentication time, then a new um, sample is going to be read from the user, right? And we compare it to something that was previously stored in the system. And then we have to treat the uh, users at the authentication time as malicious, as trying to get around this authentication, trying to do whatever they can to circumvent the security of the system, you know, so that they can get in. And so, in this case, what happens is that uh, a legitimate user submits information about their biometric, and then the servers might store it in some way, right? There's some information about user, user biometric that stays in the system, but later at authentication time, somebody else comes in, possibly a different person, and the, but the computation itself uses what was entered at a different stage. Okay, and so from that point of view, you know, with this formulation, what we want, we want to be able to protect the original user from the malicious participants in this in this phase. Okay, so uh, you know, in this case, if the user is malicious, a potentially like one of the participants in the computation are corrupt and can conspire, they still shouldn't be able to infer any sense of information about. Uh, the first phase about the user who actually enrolled. So in this case, uh, there's a need of somehow have 
a different definition, right? That extends, uh, you know, beyond what we traditionally use. And in this case, you know, what our solution that we ended up, you know, doing is having some auxiliary inputs that go from one phase of the computation to another. And so you can adjust the definition to accommodate for this case. And so where I'd like to sort of conclude with this, you know, broader picture is that, um, you know, so far we primarily focused on something, you know, uh, we'll say specific, not well, pretty broad, right? But we focused on the techniques. We focused on how we want to do secure computation. But um, there are some other questions that I think need also explorations in terms of what we want to compute, what kind of functions should be considered as safe and not disclosing sensitive information as a result of the computation. What we can do to ensure that the inputs are authentic, correct in some way, right? And somebody is not going to misuse the system. And also uh, make accommodations for link computations, especially when the participants might change from one execution to another. Right? So this is the first part that I would like to talk about. And then for the second part, I would like to focus on our recent work that deals with what functions we consider suitable for this context of you know, secure computation and what basically can we do to understand the amount of information disclosure from the output of a function. And are there any questions at this point? Good. <laughs> so I see that there's no um, efficiency in any of these. So is that integral to how, uh, how are you doing this and how are you doing this? Essentially are the two different questions or is efficiency integrated with how are you mm -hmm. doing this? Yeah. So, I mean, this was the focus, the efficiency has been the focus for a long time, right? So this is where we're saying that what kind of techniques we use, how much communication, how much computation is a part of um, the techniques that we employ, right? So this has been the focus, the efficiency was primarily the focus because the functionality, we know that everything is computable. So once we know that everything is doable, the question is how long it's gonna take. And just a, another high level question is, are these still theoretical guarantees in the sense of, uh, um, uh, you know, and uh, the database size or, or the data size and, and things like that? Or is it latency and, and actually deployed uh, measures of, of, of how many operations can you do or how long does it take? Not from theoretical bounds, but more practically computed or, or, or experimentally computed uh, latency and things. Mm -hmm. I was curious. Well, but I think what's the work that's been done uh, varies greatly, right? Because, um, you know, in some cases, what you try to do is to be as close to the optimal as possible. And maybe it's not achievable. Maybe we have to increase the complexity uh, because in this case, you have to ensure that um, the computation or the, the trace is independent of the data. Right. In some, some other cases, maybe uh, for a particular application, people decide that well, the solution of optimal complexity is not uh, ideal because it's slower in practice. So we might come up with something else that is going to be faster, uh, at least for the sizes of data that we might need to manage. Right. But I mean, if there's like a vast majority of different directions, you know, the space, and as I said, that people have been working on that for several decades. So there's now a lot of different solutions. We have one more question over here. Can the somebody in the EM, can you tell us if you can hear us? Yes, I can. Yeah, then Miti, please. Yes, I wanted to ask about your input certification. Uh, here, do you, uh, are you considering consent in that like, uh, I think uh, like the data owner sign or is it, uh, the data controller or the processor on behalf of the data owner. Yeah. 
So in this case, the verification part will happen as part of the computation. So in this case, they, if the inputs come certified, they, the signature needs to be such that you're able to use it in the computation without revealing the data itself. But the verification it will be something that's done once the computation starts. Right, so the signature itself need to be suitable for verification without seeing the data. So the audience is warming up. We have one more question. We don't need it. The ceiling microphones. Um, uh, also, do you account for um, verifying the computation? Like the server can, the servers can not do what they're just being mm -hmm. malicious and not being, not computing the function they were supposed to solve. Mm -hmm. Where is that taken into account? Well, this is taken into account in the first component, you'll say, of the techniques themselves. Because the techniques uh, control what you can assume about the computational parties. So there's two widely used standard models. One assumes that the participants are going to do what they're told. They're going to follow the computation. And another one like, uh, sort of uh, makes the, doesn't make this assumption. It basically permits the computational parties to do whatever they want. And obviously the goal in both cases is to extract information about private inputs that are not authorized to see, right? And so if you have a solution that's secure in the second stronger uh, model where the participants can behave maliciously, then there will be a detection mechanism to say that you didn't do what you're supposed to. All right. So I'd like to go to the second part. And that deals with uh, what I would say function non inverted element. So, usually, when we talk about non invertible functions or something that's one way in the cryptographic terms, right, there is some specific meaning associated with that. But this is different because what we'll like. When once you get the result of the computation, you want to ensure that looking at the result, you cannot uniquely point to the input that was used um, and so that you can arrive at that result. And then the question is, well, if I can't uniquely point to that, what if there's only three options for the inputs? Is this good enough? What may be a good sort of measure of goodness of function so that I can say that it's not invertible I cannot learn enough information about private inputs that are entered into the computation. And so in our work, uh, we um, chose to proceed with the notion of entropy because this is a standard measure that's used in a lot of different contexts for information disclosure. In this case, it's gonna be a difference, right? Between what you had uncertainly about your inputs that you had originally and what you get at the end of the computation. And so there's all there's kind of interestingly people, some people looked at that, and some people looked at this space as early as 10 years ago. But there's was only like a couple of different publications that are not necessarily considered like um, large classes of functions. But what we found is that uh, there's a couple of recent publications that I thought includes that sort of mapped it in this domain and this turned out to be very useful in the way you formulate what the meaning of um, sort of information disclosure in this context means. So there are two different definitions and they basically are written to enumerate all of the possibilities based on the output that you see, right? All of the different combinations of um, the input parties and the um, one, well, one of the parties or maybe multiple parties are adversarial and then they want to learn something about the uh, other participants in the computation. And so I would like to talk a little bit more about that, but basically if we we'll look at the computation. So from this point on, it doesn't matter how the computation itself um, is um, executed. What matters is the input that we receive and the output is being produced. And so we're going to divide all of the participants into the target group. Can be one person, can be a group of people together. 
but you'd like to learn something about them. Uh, there are some of the participants can be the adversary itself, and then we consider everybody else is to be an independent party, um, you know, say a spectator. So in this case, for example, if you have, you know, salaries from a number of different people, some of them like uh, in the adversary, there's a few people who can talk to each other and know each other's salaries. And so they can target an individual within uh, the space of the all the input owners who enter the salary and the computation and would, they would like to learn as much as they can. So in this case, the um, attackers weighted average entropy basically measures what the adversary can do by manipulating their inputs and saying, well, if I enter these kind of inputs, did I increase my chances of learning something about the target? And so based on that information, they can pick the most favorable input you know, for them that will allow the maximum information disclosure about the target. And the target's weighted uh, average entropy is based on the target's true inputs, right? Say, like, I know this is my input. If I enter it in the computation, how much can they learn about me, right? But the way we felt about it is that uh, the target has to be pretty technically savvy to be able to do this, right? Um, and so, you know, and on, on, on the other hand, also, if the target quits, based on the information that they've computed here, that's also can be treated as information disclosure about their inputs, because it's, for some, some inputs can be worse than others in terms of information disclosure. And so the fact that somebody truly you know, decides to participate or not participate is already information leakage, okay? So basically we think that the attacker's perspective is gonna be the most valuable because this is something you can do ahead of time without knowing the, the uh, true inputs that are going to be entered in the computation and use that to decide, is this function uh, suitable? Does it disclose any, does it disclose too much information for any choice that the attacker can make, right? And so this is um, what we would like to use. So, and then I think this is something I already mentioned. There's there's three groups of participants. And, you know, for our purposes, we're going to draw um, some inputs from um, certain distributions, right, depending on the application. But, you know, for our purposes, we chose the application of Boston gender gap, uh, gender gap study, which was an application that was deployed in practice is actually a very simple function. So it's suitable to analysis and you can make progress. So I wanna see, um, so there's, if you are interested in formulas, right? We've, um, you know, go to certain um, spaces, right? And there's no, for, if there's not a formula slide, this is not rigorous enough. But this is for you to show that the way it was formulated is that the idea is that because that's notion of entropy you enumerate, all of the possible um, you know, inputs, depending on the output that's actually being released, right? And you, you know, include all of those options that are weighted by the chances that actually is gonna happen, right? And so the um, notion that we're gonna use of the adversarial perspective that says that if the adversary specifies certain inputs, like X or inputs, um, and then we iterate over all possible inputs that the target can enter, then we'll want to make sure that this value is not exceeding a certain threshold or whatever threshold that might be, right? And then we'll treat the function as acceptable. Okay. So I already mentioned that the application that we picked was the average salary. And so the idea behind this Boston study was that the city wanted to know the gap by gender, um, you know, among the businesses that are working in the city, but then nobody wanted to be responsible with all of the uh, salary information that they needed to collect. And so they had to turn um, to the researchers at Boston University who set it up using secure multi-party computation. 
So the computation itself is pretty simple, right? You basically collect, you know, entry salaries by a specific job category, right? You know, you average, you know, male salaries versus female salaries, and this is the information that was released. So the function itself is the average or just the sum if you know how many participants contributed their data. Right, so this is what we picked, and one of the reasons that we picked is because uh, there was interesting comments saying that um, basically they chose to run it only if the number of participants is large enough. And in the context of the average, it's obvious if there's only two people, then there's no protection of any kind, right? They know my salary can compute uh, the second participant's salary. But the more participants you bring in, the better protection you're going to get, and we would like to be able to quantify that information. And so what you see in this plot is uh, you basically, this is the uniform distribution, which is not representative of salaries, but just for the sake of this example. In this case, there is one person who is an attacker and one person is a target, and everybody else is going to be a spectator, it's independent participant. And we, you know, picked uniform inputs between zero and fifteen just to quantify. So the amount of, um, in you know, entropy that everybody gets or initially is for uh, bits of information. Okay? And so you know, this uh, figure plots. There's two kinds of curves. One of them is the uh, targets average um, entropy, right, that it's still uh, based on the target's view. And the second one is the adversarial view. And so what you see is for the target, if the target inputs are in the middle of the range, they're actually better protected. What this shows is uh, basically how much entropy is going to be remaining, right? So, um, you know, this would be dropped from four that they had before. So the more extreme their inputs are, the easier it is to uh, learn information about them. But the adversarial view in this case doesn't change depending on, of, depending on what the adversary enters. And intuitively, this is also something we're gonna understand, right? So for the case of average or the sum, it's always possible to remove the adversary's contribution and you get basically um, the, the same value, right? Given the average, you can remove their contribution. And so from that point of view, it doesn't impact how much they learn, right? And the function is very simple. And as I already mentioned, we would like to go uh, with the adversarial view as something we can do ahead of time to decide whether we should run secure computation in the first place or not, right? All right, so what I'd like to show you um, is like uh, a few different plots that we've discovered over the course of this work, and they're interesting. They're interesting, there are some of the results that were unexpected in a way that um, allowed us to you know, like make conclusions about this very simple function, very simple computation. But we um, looked at both continuous and um, discrete distributions. For us, I mean, uh, discrete distributions are convenient, right? We want everything to be uniform because then you, know, you get the best possible protection that you can. Uh, but salaries typically uh, modeled at using log, nor log normal a distribution, which is continuous. And this is something that we also used and try to um, you know, choose the parameters for others to be consistent with that, right? So that we can, can compare that. Um, and so from that point of view, uh, we, um, you know, picked basically all of the inputs are, you know, random variables from a particular space. Um, and then we create basically derived computation for the sum, which will be the output of the function. But I wanted to show you some plots here. Um, so that there's a number of them. So these are four different distributions that we had. There was a uh, uniform Poisson, then we had normal and lock normal. But if you look at them, it was not necessarily expected that they're gonna all look the same. So what is plotted here is that for, there's one plot per, per kind of distribution, but we changed the parameters. So in some cases for uniform, we changed the range of the values. In others, you, you change the uh, basically 
you know, some other parameters like standard deviation that will tell you how much information is in, in the inputs. Um, and what the dotted line shows the original value, the original entropy that the inputs had. And then as the number of independent party spectators increases, you'll see that the information disclosure um, gets very close to very minimal, nominal, um, very quickly. And for the log normal, I'm not sure why it's not, the font is not displayed very well, but the log normal, we actually chose the parameters that are used for, for salaries. So that's why there's only one curve here, but across all of them, the um, performance of well, the trend was the same, basically. And it was interesting, but it's not necessarily expected. And so if we combine them all together, we'll see that um, if we take one distribution, then, um, you know, in this case, they're basically all perfect for a line. This is the difference between the original and the um, ball and the entropy that you get in the end, right? So this is the, um, adversarial view that we're measuring at the end. Um, and you'll see that it doesn't depend on the parameters of the distribution. The only thing that matters is how many independent participants contribute their data. So we did that. Uh, this is the absolute difference, right, between the original versus after the computation. But we also wanted to look and say, for example, um, if you try to convey this message to somebody who doesn't understand necessarily entropy, right, or security um, in a substantial way, and the way to convey, say, for example, you have a certain amount of unknown about your um, input, right, and now you're not disclosing more than 1% of what you have, or not disclosing more than 5% of what you have. And so for us, Basically, this is the relative difference between the original and what you get at the end of the computation. And it allows you to see, like, if you want 1%, then you see, well, we need to have nine participants, for example, to achieve no more than 1% of um, the information disclosure data. Or if you want 5%, no more than 5%, then you'll compute how many people you need to recruit to be able to control the information disclosure to the level that you consider to be acceptable. And then uh, there's one more, and I think there's all of them. So there's this, this was uniform, this was Poisson. You'll see that they're basically the same plots. And when we try to uh, sort of normalize them based on the um, amount of entropy that they're, they're initially had and compare them next to each other, then they basically become the same. Right. So if we combine all different distributions, the pattern is actually very similar and it, um, it differs slightly only in the extreme case, right? When we have only a couple of, of independent participants. But basically, um, what was interesting for us to see is that if we normalize the amount of certainty about inputs in the beginning, then what you get is um, you, you have to employ the same number of participants to achieve, say, 1% disclosure or 5% disclosure. Those values come, uh, you know, constant across different distributions. So basically, in this case, it says that, you know, it, it doesn't make necessarily a lot of difference uh, to switch from one distribution to another, and it turned out to be pretty robust um, in terms of, you know, this analysis. Then the next question that we wanted to answer is as close that um, you ran this computation once, uh, but then what happened in the case of the you know, Boston gender gap study is that certain businesses participated. And the biggest work was to actually convince them that this computation is actually gonna be secure, that their data is not gonna be visible to anybody, just giving this sort of a tutorial on how these things work, right? So that the next year, more companies agreed to participate and then they ran um, sort of more precise, more robust. I would say computation, they also did it by race, not just by gender, by race. So additional information was collected. 
And so in this case, we have one year when people participated. And then another year were the same, plus possibly other people participated. And we'd like to know what happens in this case, um, you know, for you know, for all of the participants. If I participated all at once, or if, if I, I participated only the first time. I participated only the second time, or I participated both times. Can we ensure that all of those groups are going to be protected when we set up this computation? And so, what I'd like to show is, um, you know, this plot show that the the top line is the original entropy that somebody had, right? So you see that um, that's um, the it doesn't go all the way to zero, right? It's just only to the top of the plot to demonstrate the difference so that you can see it well. So originally, you know, the target had a little bit over than over three bits of entropy. And the green line uh, says that if, if there's only one execution, that that's the difference is gonna be. Uh, I think it maybe was like uh, six bit years. In this case, I think it was six and then it was 24. Um, where you would have like less information exposure. And so you would see in this case is that there's only a single distribute or a single execution, right? It doesn't matter in, in, you know um, what it is, what kind of um, groups you employ, right? It's the same. But for the minute you have two different executions, you have uh, multiple curves, and this curve is actually uh, goes all the way to zero, which is truncated here so that you can see this portion better, but this goes all the way to zero. And so what they represent is that um, if we change the number of um, spectators that are common, right? So we have the first group, then the second group, and then the overlap between them is what we control. Completely different, uh, bigger, bigger overlap, all the same, right? So this is, all the same means that you know it's going to be in this hand, right? All the little different in that hand. And if you participated only the first time, okay? so what it means is that if you don't participate the second time, but there's no change in the spectators, if you're the only difference, your salary is just disclosed. Okay. So that would be in this case, there's no protection. So it's dangerous to be near this uh, end, near this end, right? But then on the other hand, if um, you basically participated the first time and you participated the second time, but all of the other people are you know, different, right? So you're also, your information disclosure is going to be uh, greater when you are you know, basically, um, Basically, if if you compose to these different sets to one extreme or another extreme, one extreme is really bad, right? If you're the only difference, you get no protection. In that extreme, you're also you know having some information disclosed about you, but it's not going to be as large. Okay. And so what's interesting that even if you participated once and you go away, just the mere fact that the computation took place again. Is going to disclose additional information about you, right? So I mean, it doesn't matter if you participate the second time or not. You're still, um, you know, there's some information supposed to take place. And so what we've discovered is that the ideal case in that um, setting will be where the overlap is in the middle, right? So at fifty percent exactly, if you have an even number of spectators, then fifty percent will be the place where everybody gets the best protection. So in a way, if you want to repeat a study, right, you try to recruit more people, there will be some who are likely to drop out. But, you know, so if, as a designer of this computation, you want to recruit people in such a way that you, um, you know, have the overlap to be somewhere um, near 50%. And then we'll look also at more executions and then it gets more complicated because there's, you know, more variables to consider. But really what matters is this pairwise intersection. So if you have three different experiments, it's um, not necessarily the sets themselves, is that the, the first, where the first and second experiments overlap, where the second and third overlap and the first and third. 
this pairwise overlaps, like in this case, it's been one overlap, right? It matters. So, so maximizing that overlap um, as much as you can, you know, in this case, you can only go to 50%. Um, in some cases, you may go to, uh, with three experiments, maybe you can only go to 30%. Uh, in a meaningful way, but that's going to be the best case scenario. All right. All right. So um, I would like to you know, conclude with what we're saying today. And, you know, you know, what we have so far, right, that I hope that I convinced you that there are still uh, directions that are interesting that I haven't received enough attention. But looking in this space, uh, you know, we examined one very simple function. Clearly, this is not enough. And unfortunately, we won't be able to create an analysis that applies to all possible functions, right? And this is a difficult problem, but perhaps you know what we can do is somehow explore functions that people are likely to run on private data and sort of understand the implications of releasing the output in this case. And I already mentioned that in the context of uh, say neural networks, right? People, you know, have other notions such as like membership attacks that are meaningful. But I think sort of looking at other functions to determine what we should do, right? How we can design mechanisms that are complying with different regulations, I think would be a significant step forward in our understanding, even convincing others, right? If we know how much information is being disclosed, whether something should be treated as regulation compliant or not, right? So I, I hope that that will inspire you to, you know, look at some of these directions and I'll be happy to talk to any of you if you're interested in um, any of these topics. Thank you. Do you have any questions? If not, Just to note that people you... online can use the Q&A feature to ask questions. Oh, do we have insight into the Q&A feature? There are no questions yet. And no questions yet. OK. If there are no questions yet, I'll start with you. How much of the first two problems are going to go away if instead of an exact computation, we do a differential private computation. What are the first two problems here? The first problem was input substitution, and the second problem was inference from the output. Mm -hmm. So the way I look at about the second one, right? So this one, um, the way I look at it is that if you want to compute something and you say you make the result differentially private, right? Then it's going to address the information disclosure. You can say that this is compliant with whatever regulations, assuming differential privacy was set up well, right? Which is being contested right now, you know, for, for practical purposes, um, because there's always trade off, right? Data, um, you know, utility versus privacy protection in this case. For, you know, the, my view on this, if we understand first how much information is being disclosed, if it's small enough or if it can, can be controlled in some way, it can be brought down to a value that's minimal, you may not need to um, sort of add noise to the result. You will be able to release the exact output and then the computations will be more accurate. Um, and, you know, so for us, in some way, understanding is the first step, right? Whether you need to do this in the first place. Um, whether, you know, you want some sort of modification to the function, right? Really, because modifications can also differ. It could be differential privacy. It could be some other mechanism, right? You make it more cars and output or you know, whatever you want to employ, right? But the way I look at it is that if we know it's already small enough, then you don't need to um, sort of change the function itself. Okay? And then you talk also about inputs, right? That if somebody submits bad inputs, um, so I mean, I think it depends on the computation, right? If you're talking um, about something large scale, you know, training model on a lot of data, then um, if somebody doesn't have, is, is not, 
is not able to significantly change the result, right? And I think it would be really um, If you're talking about my example of paternity testing, then it's not meaningful to introduce noise, saying here, you know, if you're trying to decide if your child is going to inherit this severe condition, right? The noise is not an appropriate solution <laughs> in that case. Uh, so then I think well, the answer is really depends, right? Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's good answers. Yeah, so listen. Um, uh, is there any overlap between the, the definition you gave of the input entropy and the definition of differential privacy? Not the mechanism, just like the definition. The good definition is like how much does an input affect an output? Mm -hmm. This is yeah. a little bit the same. It's like the entropy of the input given the output. So is there any overlap between those? So this is information theoretic, right? And so that's formulated in the way of entropy. And so um, this, you know, you can think about sort of enumerating all of the possibilities, which is the entropy way, right? Versus statistical information. I mean, like conceptually, this is where I view this difference, right? Um, and so this mechanism, if you do like a, a, if you try to compute it in a brute force way, then it can be very expensive. Right. So, I mean, the notion of entropy is for that reason is difficult. Basically, you have to enumerate all of the inputs and outputs, um, which is not often feasible. So, that's why, you know, in this case, we needed to derive some information. But um, differential privacy, in a way, it's a different approach than like statistical information, in a way like the distance, you know, from one distribution to another. I'm not an expert on differential privacy. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Here's yeah. one from the voice in the sky. Um, on your uh, slide where you uh, compared the different kinds of distributions and found that they all converged, um, isn't that just a consequence of the central limit theorem? Like if you're finding averages of a bunch of different distributions with the same uh, mean and standard deviation, they're going to become the same no matter what the distribution was just because of the CLT. I mean, I think they all are going to converge to zero eventually, right? I mean, I think it was this, right? No, not that slide. The the one you were just on a moment ago. Not that one. Not that one. Yeah, that, whoop, that one. Nope. Back one. There. That one. Right. So yeah. I think you know, we know that they're going to converge to zero at some point, right? Yeah, but that they're all converging together, I uh -huh. think, is just the, a result of the CLT. Yeah, but yeah, right. I think for numbers that are large enough, you would expect that. But I think for us, um, it's interesting that if you look at, say, three spectators, and you can tell them apart already. It's already close. It was the surprise. Event. I see. Thanks. All right, last chance for questions. I don't see any questions online. Once, going twice, going three times. So let's thank Marina.